Welcome to the New Generation Leader Podcast. We're giving you the tools you need to lead in the digital world. Ready to reach your true potential? This is the New Generation Leader Podcast. So coach, throughout your career, you've led in a number of institutions. You've worked with a number of other head coaches. As you look back through your career, what's one of the key lessons or insights that you took from one of those other leaders that helped you kickstart your time at Navy as head coach? You know, I think a lot of it, it goes back, honestly, even as far back as high school. It may not even be, you know, we played for a legendary coach. And I think one of the uh, one of the things that always stood out to me, uh, and actually it's kind of what I've tried to lead lead through in a lot of ways. I remember we had a running back. I won't mention his name, but they, we threw a quick pitch. It was supposed to go right. He drops the ball. All of a sudden he turns around, goes left, ends up scoring from 68 yards, you know, and he was getting blessed out the entire time that he was coming across. Most coaches that I would see would be high fiving and, you know, high fiving touchdown. Oh, you made a great play. He dropped the ball. And, you know, it stood out that that moment stood out to me as a junior in high school when the kid dropped the ball and he ended up scoring. And it has stuck with me that you don't it's not the results. It's the process, because ultimately he dropped the ball. He just ended up making a great play. And I think a lot of times what I took from that is that it is not about the results. It's about how you prepare. It's how you run the play. It's how you execute. And I think in, in life. That and in business, it's how you execute. It isn't always the results. Sometimes the results are can be failures. You can be winning and still failing, you know. And I think that was one of the moments that really stood out to me. And I've kind of based my career on that. And I know that sounds really, really crazy for a 17-year-old to in that moment recognize that. But it really stood out to me um, that that's that was the key to, to success in a lot of things. It's funny, Tim. I, you know, I was there, so I remember yep. the exact moment <laughs> happened, yep. um, and and I that outcome literally. It's it's a similar thing. Not to steal any thunder, but I still do vividly remember that. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and yeah, it does have an impact. So thanks for using that as an example. And, and I think I think you you look back on. I think a lot of times you you really take things away from every person that you work with. You know, I've worked with Legendary. I worked with Debbie Ryan. I worked with Sherry Carter. One of the moments that happened to me that also stood out that I think has shaped has shaped my thought that let your experts do what your experts do. We were in our first I was in my first college game. We were playing Wake Forest. And so we go down 12 to two. They're pressing us. She calls time out. And I'm like, Sherry, all we need to do is just reverse the ball, throw it up the sideline, hit the middle. And we're going to end up shooting layups the rest of the night. And she's like, why the hell are you telling me? Go tell them. And I mean, literally, it's on my first time out, first game we ever played, go in the huddle. We end up telling them what to do. And luckily, Wake just kept pressing that night. They should have just cut it off. And we ended up beating at Furman. We beat them. After the game, she looked at me and she said, do you know why I told you to go in the huddle? And I'm like, no, I don't. She said, you knew what you were talking about. All I could have done was screw it up. Mm. And to me, she said, at that point, you know, you've heard, let the experts do what the experts do. You were passionate about it. You knew what you were going to explain. She said, I would have screwed it up and we wouldn't have been as effective. With that being said, I also learned that she had to be confident in who she was and the fact that she didn't, she didn't care who got the credit. So there were multiple lessons within that. So when someone has something to say, let them say it and not try to regurgitate something. You know, so those are, you know, three really strong lessons uh, for me. That, that I've grown and try to use that through our leadership. And those are incredible lessons, which aren't unfortunately all that common in, no. in so many leadership settings. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a book behind me on the shelf. The title is four. And it, that's one of my favorite, most powerful three letter words is four. And really it comes down to who am I for? And exactly. so in that setting, she was for you and for the players and their best, right. not for herself. Right. So am I, am I keeping this or am I being generous and am I giving it away? And a couple episodes when we talked to 
coach Sean O'Regan, he said, it's all about filling the cup of the people around you. Mm -hmm. And so you lay down some of these habits and rhythms and start to build that culture where you are for other people and investing in them. And like Brian said on, on episode 43, are we a fountain that's filling other people up that other people can come to us and be refreshed and rejuvenated? It's, it's a great privilege to be in that kind of situation and in that kind of setting and, and lay down those examples for, uh, in your case, for your players, for your coaches and for all those key stakeholders around you. Yeah. We, we talk about uh, coach when we work with our corporate clients and even uh, church clients, pretty much anyone, uh, we have a tool called the support challenge matrix. Um, and actually this is the four quadrant, uh, picture. And, and most of the tools we use are just simple pictures. They're really easy to understand, but they tell such a such a deep and heavy message. I mean, more than you can have by first glance at the picture. So this upper right quadrant is called liberate, which is high support, high challenge. Uh, and liberators are what we tell ourselves, and that's what we're trying to develop in leadership. Oftentimes, though, so what she did was challenge you, right? But Challenge, why are you telling me? But the support was also, she believed in you enough to go tell them. Um, right. So she literally, if we were judging that, we would say, man, she did so much to liberate you from a support challenge uh, standpoint that day. So uh, really cool tool. College athletics is in the midst of colossal changes. From NIL to the transfer portal and conference realignment, athletics programs are facing mounting pressure. How are these pressure points affecting your leadership? The waves of change require a different approach to building programs, leading teams and departments, developing players, directing coaches, and in how you think about athletics. It's becoming too easy to leave and too hard to create trust. This requires you to think better, communicate better, lead better, perform better, be better every single day. Better can help. Better has built the very best of 21st century leadership thinking and tied world-class content to simple technology to help ADs, administrators, coaches, and athletes thrive in the midst of the chaos the athletic world is facing. As a listener of the show, Better is offering a unique opportunity for your college program or high school team. Better starts with you. Learn more at newgenerationleader.fm slash better. Coach, your career, you've had a number of stops in some incredible institutions, but the institution where you are carries a, a unique <laughs> culture and calling. How has that shift and transition changed how you approach recruiting and coaching and developing these players you're working with? You know, I don't know that it's ever, it, it, I've never changed my approach in recruiting. You know, I think uh, a lot of ways, I think it's about relationships. It's about being genuine. It's finding what, you know, are we a good fit for that particular kid? You know, and I think that's a lot of times, you know, a lot of people go into selling. I think one of the big things is when you're like a Carolina and Virginia, you are selling an institution, you know, because they've got a lot of different choices. When we're at the academy, we're not really selling uh, because that's a life choice. You know, you're, you're making a choice beyond basketball. You're making a choice that really, you know, I tell people, I feel like I've got the best opportunity in the country for a kid that can do it. Um, so a lot of times we lay it out in those forms and we really go after top kids and we put it out there to see you know we want to recruit basketball players that at the academy that uh see the value in the academy um i think this is a unique place i think it's a place where everybody wants you to succeed um from top to bottom the moment you walk in here it's really hard but they're going to do everything in their power for you to succeed you know i don't know if that's always been the case at some of the other institutions i've been at you know they if you're successful that's fine but I do think that, you know, from a recruiting standpoint, I think it's all about relationships. It's about connecting with people. Um, and ultimately, I will tell you, we lose some battles here because they don't want to do the five years. We, we've, we've, lost, we've lost more from people saying, Coach, if you were anywhere else, this is where we would come, but we can't do that commitment uh, to the five years. So, But I'm still really blessed to be where I'm at because I think it is an incredible opportunity. I don't have to worry about my kids. You know, I don't have to worry about their future when it's all said and done. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit, and we may bounce around. We can edit this however it smooths out. But so, are you? This is from a, a standpoint of a little bit of ignorance on how it works with the academy, mm -hmm. in terms of two things. 
uh, a transfer portal, and then uh, if NIL is any sort of issue. Um, so if they are, talk about them a little bit. How has it impacted you? It hasn't impacted you. Or if they're not an issue, say, no, we don't have to worry about those two things. I, you know, I think if you guys look at, and this was when they first came out with the in the COVID rule. You know, I'm going I'm to go back to COVID because I think a lot of this has affected some of this as well. Affected what we see in the last three years. Uh, because right now you're seeing, you know, their, their student athletes are here five or six years. You know, some kids have been seven years in. So you got 18 year old kids playing against 25 year old kids. And that's, you know, I call them kids, but they, at that point, they're young women and young men. I think the COVID rule really affected us. And you're going to see significant change after next year because that no longer, you're not going to have those five years. Um, I think you're also going to see a change from the transfer portal because now people were transferring and having two years at institutions. Whereas a lot of times they're not going to have that number of years left over. They're not going to be able to go to five years. The transfer portal does affect us because our application process closes very early. Like we'll close down in, you know, January, February, somewhere in there. Uh, because there's so many things that, that they, they have to do to be able to get into the academy. It's not a typical application, you know. Um, but can we still get transfers in? Yeah, we were actually able to get a kid in from Colorado this year that we had recruited. And that was kind of an anomaly, I'm just to be honest with you, Brian and Aaron. It's more of an anomaly than it is going to be something that you can do because here is a 47-month program. If you come in as a senior, you still have to do 47 months, regardless, regardless of how many years you have left. So if you have one year left, you actually literally have to go through plebe summer. So that's a whole different animal. Now, what I will tell you, there are a lot, what they call as priors, there are some, some kids that actually enlist in the, in the Navy and they become a prior. They've had service, but they will come to the academy and do four years there. So whatever time you come in is 47 months. Now, when we talk about the NIL, does the NIL affect us? Yes, because everybody asks about it. The one thing about the academy, they do get paid. They've always been able to get paid, but they, they get money back. They have to pay for certain things as well because everybody there is on scholarship. Whereas the what we really use the NIL is okay. You can use your NIL right now in the women's game, and you're going to get two or three hundred thousand. If you come to the Naval Academy, the NIL on the back end, you're going to make way more money than you ever make on NIL on the front end. You know that's kind of how we use it. What I will tell you though, a lot of my Power Five buddies are saying that this NIL, it's it's crazy. We've got a kid that was six points from a really good player in the Big East. I'm not going to name the school. Six points from all-time leading score. She's five foot three. An SEC school offers a hundred thousand dollars, and she goes there. And it's because she's got a fifth year, you know. So that's it's really affecting the game. You know, I've been telling everybody down here. I think at some point, I think we need to look at a salary cap. You know, because you know there are haves and have-nots in this thing, and if we go with salary cap, and they, you can't say that's. Illegal because they do it in all the other professional sports. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. Um, some of the coaches we talked to, Tim, um, who are figuring out now, either for the first time or just trying to perfect it, if you will, which I, I definitely use air quotes for the word perfect, um, uh, are more have concerns about uh, relationships among the players. Mm -hmm that NIL may end up having, especially yep. with if you're using NIL money to recruit. Um, this person who's never done anything for you, you think has potential, but you've got this third year, for example, or second year, who's consistently double digits for you, does everything you ask. I mean, it's just the consummate team player, coach on the court, everything else. But there's nothing for, for that person because you're right. You know, so uh, and we have some coaches who just want to go, you know what, I just want to use it for retention. Um, as as much as recruiting, um, are you? Do you have given everything you just talked about with your NIL discussion? Do you ha ever have any of those concerns, or have you had those types of conversations with players? No, I, I think the biggest thing for us, a little different when you're looking at the Naval Academy, is that when kids make this choice, they have the first two years. Well, a lot of people don't realize they have their first two years to decide. Okay, okay. and they can leave in their first year or their second year at any time there's no repercussions once they sign for their junior year they call it two for seven they are now signing on for five-year commitment beyond uh once they graduate about 94 percent of the kids do that 
you know, so it's, I mean, we graduate 94% of our kids in, um, in four years, which is a high, you know, it's the number, number two in the country may even be number one right now. Uh, so to that point, Brian here, we're going to usually get our kids for four years. So that's why in the situation that we were in and, and rebuilding this, we knew that it was going to take three recruiting classes at least before we could start having sustained success. You know, whereas what I think with, you know, Sean at JMU, Kenny at Virginia Tech, I think what you're seeing is there's no longer relationships as much as two years. I almost feel like we're in a two year college uh, JUCO situation where, OK, power fives don't want to recruit high school kids unless they're the top 50. What they want is for us to develop them and then they're going to come in and get them. Why would they want a high school kid when they've got a kid that has spent two years at the college level and has shown that they can be successful. And so right now, it seems like a lot of the power five coaches I'm talking to, they feel like they're general managers, not coaches. So I think what we're losing is what you're talking about is relationship building. Whereas here at Navy, I get the relationship and I'm going to have 90% of my roster for four years. So I get to make an impact over four years. I think a lot of times we turn college coaching into a transactional business versus a relationship business in a lot of ways. Yeah, that's exactly what some of the things that we hear now is it's for a lot of those schools and a lot of those coaches, it's gone from being, I love being, I love building programs to now I have to do this differently. So well, um, I think the thing like Aaron, you've written on this a little bit, you know, I think one of the biggest things that, you know, in your, in your estimation and in your expertise in this, how, how do you feel? You never hear transactional as a word that fits in with leadership. Am I right? I mean, wouldn't you guys agree with that? Yeah. Absolutely. It's not it's the goal. One of the tools we teach <laughs> is, it's transactional. And yes, I expect transaction when I have trust with the grocery store that they're going to give me great food. But in terms of a relationship, if we can take that transaction to an influential level, right. Well, that's just opened up a whole new world. Right. And I don't have that kind of relationship with the grocery store. But if I'm going to lead someone here in the 21st century, I probably need to work more towards influence than purely transactional and expecting them to produce uh, an output and get work done. Well, and I think that's the thing that, you know, I got into coaching because, I, I mean, of course, I'm competitive. Brian knows that. Like, I hate to lose probably worse than anybody. But I think you get into this because, you know, you've got an opportunity to – I tell people, you get an opportunity as a, as a coach. Very few people get to do this. You have an opportunity to change the world for two hours every day because the way that you treat your kids, the way you treat the people around you, the managers, everybody, are, they're going to pay that forward. They're watching you, you know. And, you know, the year that we went through this year – you know, you don't really find out what a true leader is until they've gotten when they've hit rock bottom. How do they respond at rock bottom? Everybody is, you know, when you're at the top of the world, and that's what is getting me with this power five and Brian, what you're talking about with NIL, people are buying teams. They've got the money. They're able to spend the money. There was a kid right now that was at a school that I know she loves and I can't say. There's another school that came in. This kid was like transferred within two days. She's got $175,000 NIL package in two days. You're telling me someone didn't tamper with that. That's the thing that's really tough. Yeah. And, and, and that sport, I mean, that's potentially more money than you're going to make in a couple of years. To go to a pro. So it's, um, yeah, that's tough. That's a, that's a whole different, that, that's one of the reasons that we like having these conversations too, is because it does put, it does change the landscape for you as a coach mm -hmm. on. And so it has to also impact in some way, I would imagine, although with you, you've always had, you always had the type of player you want to bring into your program. Right. I think you probably recruited the same way at UVA, at North Carolina, at, um, at Furman, wherever you've been. Um, but at Navy, there is still a different, I imagine, there's still a different mindset of a potential recruit that's going to have to be there it, because I mean, I just remember my own son being recruited to come play baseball at VMI and sort of the mindset of you have to love this. You can't just like it. Right. So, um, 
Well, I think the biggest thing we try to do here is um, I think in order for a kid to be successful here, first of all, they've got they've got to be able to see beyond the, the basketball floor. And they also have got to have parents that are locked into it. And that's another battle that we are fighting right now. I'm sure you guys are hearing it. The parents are the expectations ask, of the parents and the NIL and the transfer. You know, one of the things that we do when we're recruiting a kid, we have a conversation and we feel like, okay, this kid is, because I try to scare him away. Like literally the first conversation, I don't, you know, Virginia, you're trying to tell them all about it. Carolina, Carolina's a different beast, Joe. That's a whole different animal. You call Carolina, they're like, we're ready. We're coming. And it's nuts. But here at the academy, I literally try to scare them away. If we can't scare them away, then, then we start talking to the parents. If you got both on board, I think that's one thing, Aaron, that would be different is you got to have both parents on board to be successful here at the academy. Um, and like I said, we, we've gotten, we've gotten two recruiting classes and we've got a really good third class coming in. So I think, you know, we're going to be, we're, we're laying the bricks at this point. We're laying the bricks. How many well, of that's the- with building, building trust towards influence takes one brick at a time. Yes. You knock the whole thing down real fast, but it takes time to build one brick at a time. How, how is the environment different in terms of the support and challenge you get from your external stakeholders related to how they value your success in the wins and losses and investing in your players? Well, I think the biggest thing is I think they do invest in the players. I think this job and for our kids and I call it a job because they come in and plebe summer, they have six, they have a six week, you know, plebe summer that they are taught how to become military. And it's really hard. And the first year is really hard here. You know, they challenge you because, you know, like, like the uh, leadership at the academy said, they want to see how you operate in chaos and adversity because you're going to be leading. Because this is one of the preeminent leadership institutions in the entire world that we're talking about. So that's what they're, they're training leaders here. They're not really training you know, midshipmen or fighters or things like that. They're training leaders when they come out. They're going to be officers. And I think here, to your point, Aaron, like our, our AD is unbelievable Like in his support. He, he told me this was going to be a total rebuild. Okay, financially, they put in resources. He's given me the things that we needed. We knew that this was going to probably be a five-year rebuild. You know, last year we thought we would be able to, you know, get to the middle ground of it and then steadily move it up. But with all the injuries that we had at that point, now, you know, we're being tested. Our leadership was being tested because, you know, we lost eight kids and we're playing with three walk-ons, you know, toward the end of the year. So it's, it was challenging. But the one thing I will say is I I think what we did really well at the end of the year, we gave the kids a day off and told them that they didn't have to be in the gym, but if they wanted to be. And with, with what we went through, you would say, Hey, nobody's showing up in the gym. Every kid showed up for an extra workout on their own. So I felt like our staff did a really good job on that. And we can build on that. What's different for you in, in this role in terms of training, discipline, culture, mm-hmm. what you have to lay down in addition to what else they're picking up and everything else that the academy is teaching them? I tell you, I think the hardest part, though, Aaron, this was like when I first got there, we, had, we walked into practice the first day. And literally, I'm talking to everybody, and they're standing at attention. They're looking at you. And I'm like, you know, I'm like, okay, this, it was almost, I don't want to say it was inhumane, but it was not personal. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't, like, it wasn't, we weren't having fun. They showed up. They didn't know how to react. And I, I don't know how the other coaching staff was with them. I have no idea. But finally, I'm like, guys, this is supposed to be fun. Like, you come to basketball, and this is supposed to be a fun activity. This is, it was, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm like, okay, we, we, not that I don't want the respect, but in order to be, it goes back to your point, being able to have uh, influence, you know, they've got to be comfortable. They've got to be themselves. They can't be a robot. And I do think at the Academy, you're trained to please at times. And sometimes that's not a good thing. Like I think our team last year wanted to please me so much that it was actually a problem. If that makes sense, <clears throat> because they're looking to the bench to see, you, you know, and like, what, how is he reacting? What's, and I think that because it was a young team and, and we weren't having success. So they were looking for that. And I think, I, I just don't think that's a recipe for sustained success. If that makes sense. Yeah. I think, you know, one of the things that we work with uh, coach 
with a lot of the, our clients is on the idea of becoming the leader that others want to follow as opposed to have mm -hmm. to follow. Um, and so it sounds like maybe there was a little bit of a, what you encountered was they were used to following somebody that they had to follow. Right. Um, maybe that was the, that was the reason for that reaction to you where I know just knowing you personally, I know that's not how you operate. Anyhow, mm -hmm. you're a relationship based guy. So, um, so the idea of actually for us is sort of, getting the leader to break themselves down so you can also help that, right. that employee or that athlete also be able to think a little bit on their own within, within guidelines, not just take it over and not listen to right. you anymore. But um, so how do you, uh, again, with my thought with, with the Academy training and a lot of the early on training is, is I think, uh, and this may just be, I've read too many books and seen too many movies. So tell me, <laughs> But it's it's breaking down a lot of the bad habits you had to get to these good habits. And so you're you're early on during that six weeks or first year, I think their minds can be so full of did I do that right? Did I did I do that wrong? What's my next step? So um so I do see that. I imagine that's gotta be a challenge with the younger players for you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think I think what you look at in the military, and I think it's you know, we're trying to change, you know, a culture too. And here at the academy, I think a lot of people don't realize when you're in the brigade. So there's, you know, you've got the brigade, you've got 30 companies, you've got 150 kids per company. Um, there's a hierarchy, you know, there you're a plea. OK, you are a youngster. Then you are 2C. Then you are firsty. So, you know, so the plebe's the fourth year, you know, the youngster, you know, you go through all of this and there's a hierarchy of, OK, I'm in my, I'm a, I'm a firsty now. I'm at, the, I'm a senior. I'm, I'm that person. I'm the top dog. I should not have to re listen to a freshman. Well, when you get on a basketball court and you're bringing in more talented players, okay. As a freshman and they're more talented. A lot of times, some of the seniors go like, wait, wait, wait a minute. It's my turn now. Well, no, it doesn't work that way. You know, now here comes the reality of the world outside of the military. And I think that's some of the things that, you know, those are some challenges that you run into. You know, because uh, we had a really talented point guard this year. Um, and unfortunately, she went down in the first game. And I'm sure there was people that were like, wow, why is she getting the ball? You know, we were starting four freshmen to start the year. So, um, you know, I think those are some of the challenges that you run into. And talking about the academy, I, I think, you know, that hierarchy sometimes doesn't always work on what I would say successful teams. Yeah, that's 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 a really interesting thought. That one of the reasons I wanted to get you on this so much was because of that, because that's a whole different mindset. Yes, I, I think than other locations that don't have that hierarchy piece in mind. And and even I mean back to back to the seventies and eighties when we were coming through, uh, hierarchy in other programs was still a thing as well. So Absolutely. That's, um, yeah. Well, we went through it, Brian. I mean, you think about it. I mean, when we came through in the eighties, I mean. You know, our high school program it was really good. And if, if you made the varsity basketball team as a sophomore, you're really good. They never even would even think about letting a freshman, even though they should have been. You know, you look back on it, and there were some freshmen that should have been playing. But there was a mindset that we don't allow freshmen to play varsity. You know, so I think I think we've broken that down through the years. Um, so how many um, – and I'm sorry, Aaron, if I'm taking this down a different path, but I just keep having these deeper – uh, it's like the rabbit hole, right? So um, do you face situations with external voices, with with the voices, not just the parents, but the, you know, the AAU coaches, things like that, that are, um, are you having to fight that voice? Yeah, I had to fight my wife all the time. Uh, <laughs> she coached your AAU team? <laughs> well, I've met your wife. I've met your I'll wife. Tell you what, you know, the biggest thing that, that we struggle with, and I actually tell some of the kids, like when they commit to Navy, one of the things that we have to struggle with with our kids, I'm like, look, you're going to have to struggle with your friends. I said, as soon as you commit to Navy, people are going to say, why are you doing that? Why would you want to go to war? Why would you want – like you, they're not educated on it. You know, they don't understand the benefits of it. And so a lot of the things that we – and we even struggle with AAU coaches when we talk about Navy. It's like, well, I coach, I don't know if they want to do military. I'm like, well – how about we explain this to you? So what we ended up doing, and I could even send it to you guys at some point, we have a brochure that literally broke down like the basketball piece to it, the military piece to it, the career piece to it. And it was a photo, it was a, a trifle. We sent it out to over 200 college coaches. 
And we, I mean, our high school AAU coaches sent them out. And we had people call us back, coach, we didn't know you could do this and this and this. They have no idea. You know, now everybody was all on board when uh, Maverick was flying around, um, you know, <laughs> that. But I think really trying to educate uh, AAU coaches and people understanding what the, the academy is about. It's not just that they're, you know, they're going to be on a ship. We don't have, we have kids that are flying. We have kids that are in cybersecurity. We have kids going to NSA. So there is a lot of noise that we have to fight through that a lot of other people don't. And then our kids, when they commit, they have to fight through with this social media craze that we're dealing with. And people are like, why would you do that? Now, Aaron and Brian and Tim, when we see a kid commit to the academy, like, oh, my gosh, that's going to be a phenomenal, great career. But their classmates are, are brutal to it, you know, in a lot, of, a lot of cases. So we try to warn our kids about, hey, when you commit, this is what's going to happen, you know. Well, probably they, I mean, getting that, I don't want to use the word brutal, but, but, but getting that very, very transparent honesty has always got to be one of those things that leaves you feeling just good about yourself. You're never going to look back and go, I did the wrong thing here, right. or I feel bad about telling them the truth. So, well, um, and I, I think, think that's, I think it goes back to what Aaron talks about in, in some of the leadership. I think, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you have influence? How, how, how can Brian Berry have influence with me? Brian Berry has influence with me because I trust Brian Berry. I grew up with Brian Berry. I know Brian Berry. You know what I'm saying? So how, how, do you, how do you build that? And, you know, it's, you know, we talk about impact here from a leadership standpoint. And that's in, in, inspire, mentor, prepare, accountability, care. And then we use teach and trust as the T there. You know, so when you're using the, that type of having an impact on kids, you look at our Twitter. That's what we talk about. Because what, what's our job? Our job is to impact people. Our job is to impact coaches. Or well, my job is to impact coaches, impact everybody that we come within. And I think if you do those five things, okay, six things right there, you're you're probably going to have a, a positive impact on kids' lives and other people's lives. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. So, Coach, I have a question about your time at the Academy. You mentioned um, – I just lost it. Oh my gosh! We got the edit button. Right. So. Yep. <laughs> edit, edit this one. That's what we love. That we can, we can slice, <laughs> dice, cut it up. We the erase. We have the erase button. <laughs> so, Don't coach, you your you time. You wish you had the, the erase button as a coach sometimes. <laughs> yeah, oh, absolutely. <laughs> call a mulligan on that play. Absolutely. <laughs> So, Coach, in your time at the Academy, you mentioned some of the, the flair, the Hollywood appeal of, of Maverick and, and people seeing the Navy in, in all its form. Yeah. What's one of you, your top experiences that you've had as a coach, as part of the Navy community that you – it was kind of one of those pinch-me moments that just got you? I honestly, when we played Army at West Point, non-COVID – um, I mean, it was just that environment, you know, cause I'd heard all about it. You know, I've been, I mean, seriously, I've been part of, of a lot of, um, rivalries, Duke, Carolina, uh, Carolina, NC state, you know, sold at Virginia, Virginia tech, you know, places sold out even on the men's and women's side and just the electricity of, of those arenas. I've never been in anything like that. Like I literally, the electricity, when the cadets are coming on the floor, they're standing there, the pomp and circumstance of, you know, you've got um, our superintendent, the superintendent of West Point, the pride that everybody has um, during that moment, and CBS is flaring up, and it was so loud in there. I literally was turning around and looking at it. I literally looked at our team, looked at our coaches. Isn't this fun? Like, this is what college athletics is supposed to be like. Not many people get to be in that type of environment. Um, and, you know, especially at the Patriot League, I think – those are things that stood out to me. And of course, you know, the other things that the blue angels, you know, being able to see the blue angels in their show. I think the other Aaron thing that really stood out to me was I went to graduation for the first time to take in the graduation of the Academy. And it dawned on me why there's so much pride in the academies. Um, because every kid there, as I listened to the speeches of the class president of, um, you know, the brigade commander, everybody there, you realize then that all 1,100 of our student athletes or, or midshipmen, not student athletes, but midshipmen, they had been through the same thing. They had a very like experience. 
They had been through struggles together. Whereas at Carolina and Virginia, our kids had way different experiences. All of these kids had done the exact same thing. They'd been through, you know, lack of a better word, they've been through hell at times, you know, to please. And then you start to realize that they call a 50 year link in the chain. So if you're a 2024 grad, your 50 year link in chain is 1974. Then you start thinking about, wait a minute, how many years has this been in that co connectivity? It really dawned on me at that point. I had not thought about it until I went to graduation and realized then this is a really special bond that, I, I mean, I get chills sitting here thinking about it right now, you know? That's awesome. That's great. Well, Coach, as we head towards wrapping up, I want to ask you the question that I ask everybody on the podcast, which is the question I asked Norm that led me to write the book. What is it that you've learned later in your career that as you look back, you wished you had learned earlier? I think one of the things I learned, I mean, I've always felt this way, but, you know, a lot of times I was an assistant. I wasn't the head, you know, in, in some cases. You know, I, I like to call it bottom-up leadership, okay? And the reason I call it bottom-up leadership because the smartest people in the room most of the time are the custodians and the secretaries. What people don't understand is that they know – all the nuances of the school. They know the inner, like I'm saying school or whatever team, they they understand the nuances of that building, that organization probably better than the people at the top because they're in the grind of it every single day. We had something that, um, we did something when I was a principal at uh, William Wetzel Middle School. If you had an idea, okay, you couldn't complain. Y'all probably heard this. Don't complain unless you have a solution. Because right now, what, we, what we're doing is no one has a better solution, so it's the best thing we know. If you have an idea, you had to run it by the custodians first. Okay? So if it affected their job negatively, we would not do it. Okay? Part of that was because now when you are making up your idea, you aren't thinking about the world. Okay? You're thinking about the entire impact of your decision. Because every decision that we make, every decision I make as a coach, every decision as you guys make as leaders within your family, every decision you make within your organization affects every single person. Hmm. And most people are only worried about their little bitty world and not about what the impact has on everyone else. So literally, and I had, I had a teacher come into me and go, hey, I want to do this, this, and this. I said, well, have you talked to Lucinda and Tyrone? I'm like, well, no. I'm like, well, did you not? Here, so I didn't think you were serious. No, I said, I'm very serious. What that also did, what do you think happened to our custodians? They felt empowered. They felt like they had a voice. They felt like they mattered. Okay. All of a sudden, when you matter from the bottom up, now when that hurricane comes in and blows the school down, who's going to be the first people there to put it back together? It's going to be the custodians. It's not the leadership at the top. And I think that was one of the things that we were able to build an inclusive environment. And probably my greatest achievement is probably at William Wetzel Middle School when we have 50% pass rate and went to 90%. Mm. You know, we can talk about basketball all we want, but ultimately that was probably the biggest achievement and thing I'm most proud of. Yeah. <clears throat> so Aaron, I think all of our teacher friends and academic administrators, when they listen to this, they're gonna want Tim's contact information. <laughs> And come at him with a job over. See if they can talk him with maybe. <laughs> no, but that, that really is important. Tim, as an aside, um, like the whole idea with the custodians, this, this really doesn't have a whole lot to do with the leadership talk, but um, when I was in the hospital five years ago going through that, mm -hmm. um, lots of friends, lots of pastors from around the area, they always wanted to come pray with me, which I greatly appreciated right. and coveted. But the ones I most appreciated and most got into – where every now and then when the custodians would come in and want to pray with me. Yeah. yeah. Cause it was, it was always, it always hit so much differently. So some of those were the first that I would go back to one hospital in particular, after I made it through everything to go find them and just yeah. then see the looks on their faces when you just did take some time to come back to them and just give them that. They appreciate the thank you so much more, I think, um, because you've made them feel empowered or impactful. Um, which is, which is a great thing. So well, thank you. I, 
So. Well, I think one of the big, I mean, if you go to my office today, I have a note from a custodian at North Carolina that when I left, she had written on there, I'm going to miss you, blah, blah. And it's sitting, and it's a reminder of a, hey, you got to be nice to every single person and you value every person. Like our custodian in, um, at the Naval Academy, we call her the real head coach. She meets every recruit coming in. We call the real HC, you know, and I think those are the things that, that really matter. And she feels really good about herself. And, they, you know, and, and that's what, that's what we're supposed to do. It goes back to what you guys said. How can we fill other people's bucket? You know, and it's not just your kids. It's the people we're surrounded with. You never know the impact that you're going to have, you know, she may be able to do something for somebody else, you know, in the, in those, in those veins. And I think that's what coaching leadership, everything is about is, is go back to your point. How do, how do we uplift everybody? You know, sometimes, and that's not an easy thing to do guys. The hardest conversation is the honest conversation. You know, and I think that's the other thing with leadership, honest, the, having the hard, tough, honest conversation, is the hardest thing in leadership that you can do. Most people nowadays want to be passive aggressive. They want to, they want to do everything with their thumbs, you know? And I think that that's, we, we've lost some sight of that. Yeah. So, so Tim, one last thing for me, um, a lot of times when we have these conversations, the idea of filling up others' cups or pouring from your own cup comes up because it is a, a, an important part of, of leadership. Um, one of the things that we teach though, is that, as a leader, you you can't pour from an empty cup. Mm -hmm. What types of things do you do to keep your own cup full? You know, Brian, I was not, you know, my wife's chuckling about that because I think that was something I didn't do this year. Okay. You know, through all, through all the struggles that we had, you know, through all the injuries, the losing, you know, trying to fight some other battles at the academy that we were trying to fight. Um, I was not refilling my cup. You know, I, I think we come from a background and I think you understand this probably more than anybody. We come from a background of, okay, put your nose down, work hard. And someone's going to see they're going to see your value. And I think in some ways, sometimes that's what I did this year was that I had the ax out and I was chopping every tree down in the forest. And it sometimes, you know, you need, instead of trying to chop it all down, you need to get to the top and see what was happening to the leaves. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense, you know, mm -hmm. and I think that is something typically what I do is spend time with my family. I go back to Madison. I try to play a little golf. I try to take some time for myself. Um, I didn't do a very good job of that this year. After, this is the first first break that I've had. Um, and I think that that's I think it's important because if you don't recharge, sometimes you, you can burn down. Luckily, I have my mother's energy and, you know, my mother. So I can go for a long time <laughs> with that. But I think that that's, it's really important to be able to do that. Also, um, Aaron, you'll love this. I'm, I'm, I love leading leadership books. I'm, I'm reading Winning by Clay, uh, Clive Woodward, uh, the rugby, uh, English rugby. Um, I didn't realize it was going to be 470 pages. I don't know if I'm going to finish it while I'm down here. But do like to read about other people. Do like to read about leadership. Looking at, um, looking at ways to be better. You know, and I think that's the challenge. In that vein of helping you fill your cup, um, we're going to send you a, a book written by one of our uh, founders of Giant. It's a gentleman named uh, Jeremy Kubasek. Um, it's a book called The Five Gears. It's really, you'll love it. Um, it takes the old, you know, the old five stick that you used to drive probably at some point uh, in your life. Yeah, did that. That was my first car, man. Yeah. <laughs> um, Get the so manual we'll, moving. <laughs> yeah, it'll help you. It'll help you relive some good times, um, but it gives a different name to each of the gears and just helps you, especially with family. Like you're there now, you're probably reestablishing a few relationships, being able to get away a little bit, rekindle some of that stuff. Um, whereas a lot of times you're probably with the, with the team, you're you're in fifth gear, which is just focus mode, and um, a lot of times you miss out on other relationships if you're always in focus mode. So. It's just a it's just a little gift if you have time to read it. Great, um, it's Absolutely. available on audio. Books. Audio books are a great thing for me, um, but it's just a, a little thank you for coming on with us. So um, I'm going to say my goodbyes now and then turn it over to Aaron. But Tim, it's always good talking to you. I don't you know we don't get to do it nearly as much. Um, no, nope. uh, uh, unfortunately this year we have seen each other maybe one at least once more than we probably really wanted to wanted to. <laughs> yeah. um, 
But um, anyhow, thanks so much for taking time out of your vacation, especially to come on here. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, big fan of yours, always have been. Uh, so if anything else we can do to help support you, just don't hesitate to reach out. So appreciate you. Yeah. Well, thanks, Coach Tim Taylor from the Women's Basketball Program at the U.S. Naval Academy. Thanks for coming on and sharing more of your leadership journey, your coaching journey, how you're investing in the next generation, uh, a new generation, if you will, of women's basketball players uh, and Naval Academy graduates. So uh, thanks for coming on, cheering you on this coming season. And uh, you can get all the show notes, the tools we've mentioned. We'll include links to that as well as how you can follow along with Coach Taylor and their upcoming season at newgenerationleader.com slash four or five. Thanks, Coach Taylor. We appreciate it. Appreciate you guys. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for listening to the New Generation Leader podcast. Subscribe today on your podcasting platform. Download the show notes and unlock your true leadership potential at newgenerationleader.fm. Thanks for listening today, and we look forward to seeing you next time on the New Generation Leader podcast. Thank you.